Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the BirdLife webinar on the East Atlantic Flyaway as a part of the celebration of World Migratory Bird Day or celebration of migratory birds in general. Uh, my name is Baden van Geemenden. I will be the host behind the scenes. The true star of today is Annelien Smith Robinson from BirdLife South Africa and she will tell you all about this webinar. Okay, over to you Annelien. Thanks, Warren. Good day. Uh, well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Where you're joining us um, from around the world. Um, welcome to BirdLife's East Atlantic Flyway webinar. And as Warren already mentioned, um, I'm Hanelin Smith Robinson from BirdLife South Africa. So we're right at the end, the southern point of the flyway. And today we're going to be talking about the East Atlantic Flow and we're going to be doing that to celebrate um, World Migratory Bird Day. So about 1,800 of the world's about 11,000 species migrate annually and they're dependent on all the sites along the flyway, either for feeding, for breeding, for resting, for overwintering. So this World Migratory Bird Day is a campaign that's arranged by the UN treaties, the Convention on Migratory Species, as well as the African Eurasian Water, Migratory Waterbird Agreement. And we're very fortunate today to have the um, AWA Secretariat joining us and who will also be presenting later in this webinar today. So really there's two celebrations annually, the second Saturday of May and then the second Saturday of October because of the cyclical nature um, of the migration. And the theme for this year's uh, World Migratory Bird Day is all around birds connecting people. And we're talking specifically around ecological connectivity and also restoring and conserving the integrity of the ecosystems that's so important for these migratory birds. So I'd just like to like you, let you know a few things before we kick off. Um, we're recording this webinar. We're going to make it available on YouTube at a later stage. And then after our first four presentations, there's going to be a question and answer section for about 20 minutes. So please do type your questions and answers into the Q&A box. So if you go right to the bottom of your Zoom, you'll see there's a Q&A. Please um, put your questions in there and feel free to also put your questions in there in your home language. Um, and we'll be, do our best to translate on this side. So um, with that, I'm going to go into the first presentation, which is by Dieter Hoffmann. And Dieter is the head of international country programs at the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. And Dieter is going to be telling us more about the BirdLife East Atlantic Flyway Initiative. Thanks, Dieter. Thanks, Annelien, and welcome everybody to this webinar. Uh, as Annelien said, I'm head of Global Lands at the RSPB, but I'm also sharing the BirdLife uh, East Atlantic Flyway Initiative Task Force. Uh, we all know the, the flyway stretches from Greenland in the north to South Africa uh, and includes about 75 countries. Oh. Uh, there are about 90 million birds who depend on, on the flyway. 
uh, and it's particularly the migratory waders and shorebirds who depend on intact key sites along the flyway. Landbirds migrating broad fronts are being threatened by rapidly changing landscapes. For drivers such as habitat loss, degradation, hunting, uh, really lead to massive declines. And indeed, migrants are some of the fastest declining spe bird species in the world. In the UK, for example, uh, the turtle dove has declined by 95% over the last uh, 40 years. In response to that threat, uh, BirdLife has set up the, the BirdLife East Atlantic Flyvation Initiative, which currently includes 30 partners from Africa and Europe. Uh, it is coordinated by a task force of five partners uh, from Africa and Europe. The strategy for the, for, the, uh, for the BirdLife East Atlantic Flyway Initiative is to have a healthy population of migratory birds along the flyway in harmony with people and nature. And in order to achieve our vision, we need to improve our understanding of key threats along the flyway. We then, of course, need to improve the conservation management of habitats and sites. Uh, we need to strengthen the capacity of bird life partners and others to undertake local action and we need to work in a coordinated way. Overall, the, the flyway includes about 620 shore and land birds and we have chosen six flagship species which you can see on, on the screen. Uh, what, what is the BirdLife East Atlantic Flyway Initiative doing? We are working with others to continue the monitoring of populations through, for example, simultaneous counts, for example, the, the water bird count. We do satellite and geolocator tracking, habitat and site assessments, and we have gathered all the information together in various workshops to, to find out what's happening. We know some of the most important sites for flyways, for the flyway, and particularly for the water birds, which we see on the, on the left-hand side of the screen is in blue. The situation is a bit more tricky for, for land birds, which you see on the right-hand side. What are we doing? It's conservation action. For example, fly, uh, traditional sand, salt pad management, which is a project which includes a number of countries where we try to uh, promote the traditional use of salt pans so that birds and people can coexist. Uh, we are giving out small grants for shore and land birds. We are doing a lot of advocacy. So there's a general plan for land birds under AMLAP, and we have a new species action plan for turtle dove under the European Union. A lot of the bird life network is about partners working together. So we have got a dynamic partner to partner support program. For example, RSPB supports and works with partner in West Africa and South, Southern Africa and South Africa in turn supports partners in other countries in Southern Africa. We have produced an interactive map which you can use and um, somebody will put this in the, in the chat where we, we uh, ask BirdLife partners to put the information about their site conservation works in, uh, along the flyway, which helps us to coordinate, of course. Uh, and we are working together to develop projects along the flyway. So for example, in North Africa, you see the three palm trees where AAO, the partner in Tunisia works with partners in Mali and Morocco to develop uh, programs for AACES. So there's a lot going on. The initiative is still very young. Uh, so we invite you all to participate actively. And if you need any more information, contact any, uh, any of us in the task force. Thank you. Many thanks, Peter. We'll just remind you to put your questions and answers into the Q&A box. And for that, we'll move on to our next presenter. 
and that is Jose Alves from the University of Aveiro in Portugal. And Jose is a senior research associate at the university, and he's going to be talking to us about black tailed godwit migration along the East Atlantic Flyway. Thanks, Jose. Thank you very much, uh, Annaline, and thank you as well for the invitation um, for me to present a little bit of, of the work. I hope you can now um, see our, my screen that, uh, that I'm sharing. And um, I must say that I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes. Maybe this is a little bit more than our previous speaker, but I hope this is the um, time slot that I was given. So with that, I'm going to just uh, start by saying that I would like to tell you a little bit about our research that we do at the University of Aveiro, where I'm currently based in Portugal, and talk a little bit about uh, the weather connectivity, but also uh, the performance of these birds across the flyway. So how the sites are linked uh, seasonally throughout the different uh, periods of the year. So one of the things that I do uh, with the students that I teach at the University of Aveiro is to tell them a little bit about these, these, these birds that we work on, particularly waders, and I like to show them a couple of species. One of them is the standard link. Um, it's a small wader species that weighs about 60 grams. Another one, the gray plover, uh, a little bit heavier. And finally, one of our, or my favorite species, the black-tailed godwit. And what I tell my students is all of these species occur just next door. They are on every wetland in Portugal, all three of them. Not only that, but they do quite impressive migrations as well. So for example, the sanderling, which weighs 60 grams, migrates all the way to Greenland for the breeding season. Likewise, the black-tailed godwit migrates sometimes in flights that are non-stop over the North Atlantic, mm -hmm. about 250,000 kilometers to Iceland. And the gray plover, which is a high Arctic breeding species, travels all the way to uh, Siberia. So why do these species go into the trouble of migrating all the way to the Arctic? Why do they risk sometimes flying over open water uh, for 2,500 kilometers without stops? And the Arctic, as you know, is characterized by very, very cold temperatures for most of, of the year. So this is a little bit of a surprise, perhaps, to think about the migration of these species and the efforts they go through to reach their um, Arctic breeding areas. The main reason they do that is actually to increase their fitness. Um, and this might be a bit too technical, but basically it means that it's the ability to produce offspring. So the ability to have higher productivity. Now, I've told you that the Arctic has really cold temperatures throughout most of the year, but there is a period um, of the season that this, um, these temperatures go up. And in fact, there's about four months in the Arctic and subarctic regions where water is in the liquid state. So the average temperature is above zero degrees. If you compare that with a temperate area where many of these species winter, this period, it's much longer. So the window is much wider. Now, the fact that this window is so short in the Arctic means that a lot of the ecological processes they, that take part throughout the year are concentrated in a very short window of time. This means that all the flowers are flowering within this period. It means that all the invertebrates get out and go about their business, which means that wader chicks can feed on them. And this is crucial for species that need to grow really, really fast. And this is the case of the waders, many of which last for 10, 20, or even 30 years, but they are able to grow from a hatchling, from a baby size, if you will, to an adult size in about 25 to 30 days. So this is quite important um, for these species because they will, of course, need to migrate back to their wintering areas. So here we have an adult and a recently born uh, oyster catcher youngster which has about 30 days and already has the size of its father in this case. There's also one more reason um, to go all the way to the Arctic and do these uh, incredible migrations. And this has to do with the fact that the Arctic during the summer in the Northern Hemisphere has 24 hours of daylight. And this is really helpful in terms of protecting your young from predators. There are, of course, predators here, such as the Arctic fox um, and others, such as skuas or owls. But the fact that there's enough light or there's light for a long period of time 
means that you can protect your young um, very, very well. So now we know why these species go all the way to the Arctic, but there's also interesting things that occur throughout um, this community um, of, of, of species. One of them is that um, if you move from these three points that are located in the Tagus estuary in Portugal, a little bit to the north to Ria da Aveiro, where the University of Aveiro is located, you find these same three species. If you keep going north to France, you also have them there, oh, sorry, in Spain in this case, but also in France, as I was saying, they're also there. Um, in the Netherlands, in the Wadden Sea, or in the UK, in the Wash, you can find all these three species and many others. Not only that, if you go south from Portugal, if you go to Morocco, you also find them there, for example, in America, Zerga. If you keep going south to the Bantarga in Mauritania, the same thing. And in the Vijagos, for example, in Guinea-Bissau, you find them all there. So this means that these species um, travel to the Arctic from different locations and they span a wide latitude of their winter range. And we can think about this migration as being a little bit of a costly um, period of the year, costly event. So why do these species have such these wide distributions? And we can also think about why would they go so far, let's say to Guinea-Bissau, if they could stay in Portugal? So this is one of the questions we've been thinking a lot. Um, and we tend to see migratory birds as fitness optimizers. So they're trying to optimize the capacity to produce young. And if you do that, there's two main periods of the seasons, the breeding season and the winter season, and they will have different requirements. So we can imagine that in the breeding season, it's the time to invest all these profits. And this could be investing on a large, larger clutch size, for example. It could be investing on longer periods, incubating your eggs, if you have enough fat or, or reserves to do so. It could also be in investing a lot in caring for your young to making sure that you produce a lot of, uh, of them. In the winter season, the motto is a little bit different. It's about reducing costs and investing in savings. And the cost you could reduce uh, could be the migration distance, migration time, it could also be molt. If you have a very good condition, you can do molt really fast. But also, and particularly in terms of acquiring enough resources through foraging and sparing your energetic costs. So now we have a kind of a framework to think about this. Can wintering further south be advantageous at all? And we put these ideas into test by looking into one of my favorite species, the Icelandic black-tailed godwit. Um, this species breeds almost exclusively in Iceland, or this population, I should say. Um, it winters in Western Europe, all the way north from the British Isles, down south to the Iberian Peninsula. Um, we've taken advantage of their long legs and been tracking them using very low-tech plastic collar rings that we put on their legs. Um, and also we have a huge network of observers and volunteers throughout this distribution range that contribute with re sightings of these, these birds to us. So we selected three study sites, two in the north of this range in South Ireland and the east of England, and one in the south of this range in Portugal, specifically in the Tate estuary. And what we did here is that we went out to do a lot of field work. We measured uh, several parameters, namely the intake rate, so how much food they're taking from their habitats, how much time they spent foraging, how much time they spent roosting. And also we've measured um, specific parameters linked to their energy. And by that, I mean uh, temperature and solar radiation and also wind speed, which vary across these locations. And of course mean that in some areas they will be more exposed, for example, to lower temperatures or to higher wind speeds. Once we've collected all this data, we were then able to put uh, this graph together for the period of two winters. So from October to March, in two years, we were able to estimate how much energy does these birds need to keep their body temperature. So Portugal is really warm, so they don't need a lot of energy. It's almost zero in some of the days of the winter. But if you move to Ireland, because temperatures are a little bit lower, then the energy to keep their body temperature is a little bit higher. And in the east of England, because it's really exposed to the winds from North Sea, this is even more so. 
So there's quite a big difference between the energetics of these birds in these different locations. It's the same species in three different locations requiring different levels of energy. Now, all these species uh, have a basal metabolic rate. So they are, this is for God, it's, it's about two watts. So only birds from the east of England are really needing more energy than what they would be spending on a resting state. Because we've also measured their intake rates, we know how much energy they take from the habitat. So we know now how much energy they can get from their food, uh, also for these three locations. For England, this is a little bit constant early in the winter, but then it decreases. Uh, for Ireland, there's a little bit of a dip in December and January. And for Portugal, the energy they get is much, much higher. It's more variable, but it's overall higher. So now in the same plot, we can just convert the energy that we had on the previous plot. And we see that at the basal metabolic rate for birds in Portugal and in Ireland, they have a lot of profit. So they have very positive energetic balance. But for the east of England, they need a little bit more energy. And actually in January and March, they are not getting enough energy from their habitat to keep their body temperature. So just to keep warm. So to sum this bit up, if we look at the energetic balance for birds, for Icelandic godwits in Portugal and Ireland and England, what we have is a very positive balance for Portugal. It's also positive in Ireland but it's actually close to zero. So it's not statistically different from zero, but uh, in England, these birds are really, really constrained on their energetics. And this has consequences for these birds. If we then look at the annual survival for this, this species across the three sites, we see that it's above 90% for the two sites with a positive energetic balance, but it's significantly lower for the east of England. So these birds are constrained on their energetics and really this shows on their survival. Of course, migrating to Iceland from England is um, about 1000 kilometers and this is much longer from Portugal. So there could be here a trade-off between this energetic balance, which is very positive in Portugal, but then requires a longer migration to their breeding areas in the Arctic and Subarctic. So is flight distance a big toll for these birds? And we looked into that in Iceland. On their arriving dates in the south, east and west coast of Iceland, every year we've been making uh, use of the collar rings that we put on the legs of these birds. This is a bird uh, ringed in Portugal. It's known as orange, green, orange, green flag. Um, and what we do is that we go out there to these locations in Iceland and we record the arrival, arrival dates of these birds into the country. So we can uh, look at the differences in arrival dates from birds from these three, three different study sites. And what we see is that birds from Portugal and Ireland, which have a very positive, positive energetic balance, arrive much earlier than birds from England. So birds from England are constrained on their energetics. They have to fly a smaller distance, but still they arrive later. Does it matter to be early in Iceland? Um, this is one of our study sites in the south of Iceland. Um, it's early in the season. It looks good, green and lush, but um, there's also uh, a risk of arriving too early. This is again orange, green, orange, green flag with a little bit of ice on its bill. But still, it is important to arrive early because it means that you have more time to find your mate, you have more time to nest and care for your young. And indeed, we've recently shown that the recruitment probability, so the probability of their youngs to recruit to the population, it's much higher earlier in the season. So for birds that are um, um, hatching in late May or early June, their probability to recruit the population is higher. So this means that it is indeed important for the adults to arrive early in Iceland so they have enough time to produce young. So I hope I haven't scared you away with too much data and too many plots, um, but this is to show you a little bit of the work that we do across the flyway and using research to really understand the connectivity, but also the performance of these birds throughout the flight. I'm gonna finish with a little bit of an update on one of the issues that we're facing currently in Portugal, which is the governmental plan to install a big international airport 
in the Tagus estuary um, in Portugal. This is a photo of a flock of about 80,000 black-tailed godwits in this same wetland um, taken last January. So um, Lisbon, um, it's, it's the capital of Portugal and it has, it has by its side the major wetland of the country, the Tagus estuary. This is a, a wetland with about, with about 320,000 square kilometers. It has multiple habitats such as intertidal flats, salt marshes, salt pans that uh, Dieter also mentioned, and also rice fields, as, as I just said. It holds about 200,000 water birds, so waders, but also other species such as uh, storks and egrets, etc. Uh, in winter, but in migration it is estimated to hold about 300,000 water birds. It is, it is a reserve protected by national law as a natural reserve, but also by the European Directive as a special protection area and is part of international agreements as, such as Ramsar and it's designated as important bird and biodiversity area by bird life. This uh, estuary is quite, is quite large, as, as I just said, and part of it is, is protected. And this protected area includes both intertidal areas, but also high tide roosts. And indeed, these intertidal areas are very, very important as feeding locations for, for waders particularly. And the high tide roosts are really important for resting during high tide. So the birds are moving between these intertidal feeding areas and high tide roosts um, according to the tides. So the idea of placing an airport here, which is technically outside the physical structure is technically outside the protected area, is expected to have quite considerable impacts across the estuary. I'm going to show you this image, which highlights the place where the, where the physical airport will be, by the icon of the airplane, but also the noise cones that uh, will come out of this planned airport. Um, it will be an airport with uh, frequent flights, so commercial flights, that will be flying, of course, low altitude as they take off and land into one of the peninsulas in this estuary. Unfortunately, um, at the moment, uh, the Portuguese government has allowed this to go forward uh, after considering the, the environmental impact assessment study. Um, we are very critical of this, of course. One of the things is that uh, only impacts are considered relevant at 65 uh, decibel at that, that noise level, but that translates to about 50% of the birds in these areas changing their behaviors. This means flying off or being vigilant or doing alarm calls, etc. Uh, in the study or in the protected area, it is highlighted that 20% of the intertidal, which is prime feeding habitat, will be impacted. But of course, the estuary is much wider than the protected area itself. And we estimate that it means that 50% of the intertidal feeding area will be affected. There is simply no um, intertidal area available to compensate for this. So this is a really real problem for these birds. And I show you the connectivity and the performance of these birds have at the moment from Portugal. In the case of the Icelandic black-tailed godwit, they seem to be doing really well which also means they produce more young, so they're responsible for sustaining a higher part of the population. This is a little bit of trouble in our, in our side. But um, I don't want to finish on a negative note, so I just wanted to say that we're doing a lot to try and raise awareness about this issue. So there's a, an article that came out on Weather Study uh, about this. Um, we've also recently published in Science, which was great because we've raised a lot of awareness for this, for this cause. And at the moment, what we have is an ongoing court case in Portugal, uh, where we are trying to um, make the Portuguese government recognize limitations on the envir environmental uh, assessment, impact assessment study. And also, um, we're doing a lot of research also with BirdLife and RSPV and colleagues um, across the flyway, de demonstrating the importance of the takes estuary, not just in Portugal, but of course, um, across the flyway as birds have no, um, have no boundaries. And that's it. I won't take more time from you. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jose, for that incredible presentation. It was 
really interesting and also quite worrying towards the end. Thanks. Uh, our next speaker is Mutari, Mutari Aminu Kano, and he's the Chief Executive Officer at the Nigerian Conservation Foundation. And Mutari is going to be sharing a conservation achievement along the East Atlantic Flyway with us. Thanks, Mutari. Thank you very much, Hanali, and thank you, uh, Jose. I think that was really a good thing that you ended up on uh, the case study about what's happening in the Tagus estuary. So it presents to us sort of um, an example of some of the challenges that happen to key sites along the flyway, and it presents it from uh, a European developed country perspective and the great work you are doing in order to address that. So I think this dovetails very closely to my presentation, which is going to uh, show about another key site, this time in the global south, and how some of the challenges are really similar, but uh, a lot of them are different, and therefore the approaches have to be different and what we are doing as a bird life partner um, in order to achieve conservation of the sites for uh, migrants. So the site I particularly want to talk about is the Hadeja Unguru wetlands. It's in the northeast of Nigeria. If you see the map that is on your screen, that is the bulge of Africa. And in the bulge of Africa, there is this central belt, which is uh, the Sahel, uh, a bit dry, really contiguous with the arid zones of Africa in the north, but a lot of really very key important wetlands. And if you look towards the center of that, there is the Lake Chad. Uh, the Lake Chad itself is a very, very important wetland in this area, spanning four countries, but as part of the larger Chad Basin, sort of, is just to the left of that, you will see some little bit of blue streaks to the left of the Lake Chad. Now that is the Hadeja Unguru wetlands. It's in the northeast of Nigeria. It's a very important site for resident birds, for inter-African migrants, but also for Palearctic migrants. So what are some of the characteristics of the site? Um, it is very important in terms of its ecology, its hydrology, its sociology, and its economy. Um, as I said, it's a very important site for water birds. Um, uh, uh, normally it holds more than 1% of the West African populations of at least nine waterfowl species. And, um, uh, in one assessment, I think sometime in the mid-90s, it was found to hold 30% of the recorded populations of ruff in the whole of West Africa. And some of the key species, in addition to ruff, are uh, white-faced whistling duck, gargony, and a lot of um, uh, ducks, herons, and um, other groups of birds. Uh, it is a national, part of it is part of a national park in the area. Uh, there are several Ramsar sites within this Sahelian uh, floodplain wet, wetlands, but um, uh, as most people who are um, conversant with conservation in the global south, uh, these sites are really not managed in most cases, even not to say not well managed, but not managed at all. Because uh, say the park authorities that are responsible for managing the national park have a lot of challenges in terms of the number of people, the staff, the rangers they have on the ground. Um, there are very few rangers uh, manning the national parks in this area. And then even the few have very uh, little and very inadequate equipment. So a legal enforcement kind of approach to conservation of this site is definitely uh, not very effective at this stage. Um, the area 
is a Sahelian floodplain wetlands, as I keep emphasizing. So its hydrology is very, very important. At some stage, uh, some of the rivers that drain into these wetlands go right up to the lake chart and contribute some percentage of the waters of the lake chart, but no more. Uh, but the waters in the wetlands are really very important for groundwater research, uh, recharge. And the size of the wetland is about three and a half thousand square kilometers. Most of the area is flooded, uh, is seasonal wetlands, but about 40% of it is permanently wet. Um, so it is very important for the hydrology. I will explain uh, why when I get to my next stages. In terms of the sociology of the area, there is also a very, very complex and interesting dynamic. There are about one and a half million people living in the Hadejah of Nguru wetlands, and more than 70% of them are in extreme poverty. And therefore, um, in order to sustain their uh, subsistence level uh, livelihoods and so on, uh, a lot of cases, they exert pressure on the environment and on this wetland. Also, there's a lot of uh, resource use conflicts, especially between farmers and herders in the area. Um, luckily, and thank God, there isn't uh, a, a very, very active case of the insurgency that is facing that part of Nigeria. You all know about the Boko Haram insurgency. So right within the wetlands, it doesn't seem to be very active, but in the periphery around it, uh, that is an active area for military operations and for uh, the terrorists of Boko Haram. Uh, in terms of the economy being a wetland surrounded by dry lands, but also having this um, important rich natural resources, it plays a major role in the regional economy of Nigeria. It supports farming all throughout the year, some with irrigation, but some even in the dry season, but without irrigation in terms of what we call residual moisture farming, along with rain-fed agriculture. It supports fisheries, it's one of the major uh, fisheries um, uh, uh, production place in Nigeria, and then uh, animal husbandry, which is mostly pastoral nomadic groups that go there. So this is sort of to paint a picture of uh, the characteristics of the area. Um, and the main threats to migratory birds there are habitat change and then direct exploitation in terms of hunting and trapping. And habitat change, of course, as a result of many factors. The whole of the Sahel and um, uh, this part of the world is uh, facing climate change. But in addition to climate change, some of the, the, the effects of climate change are, uh, are compounded by upstream dams that have dammed the river upstream of the wetlands and therefore uh, change the flooding regime within the wetlands. And these are serious ramifications for the ecology, economy, sociology, and um, uh, all other parts uh, of the wetlands. There's where the dams are, there is intensive agriculture, but within the wetlands, there is also extensive agriculture, slash and burn, agriculture. So there are pressures that come on the wetlands which are from within as well as those from the those without. So apart from agriculture, there is um, unsustainable fuel wood extraction, cutting down of the trees to obtain firewood. There is overgrazing from the pastoralists and there is overfishing. Uh, there is also an invasive species of grass that has invaded the channels and the water bodies especially, and is choking up those water bodies, drying them up and making the wetlands a bit drier. And this habitat change is having a lot of effect on um, uh, the ecology of the area, like I say, along with the hunting and trapping. 
uh, the picture to the right of your screen was taken just last week in one of the major markets in the region uh, where the national bird of uh, Nigeria, which is the black crown crane, is illegal to, uh, to trap it, to hunt it, to, uh, uh, to kill it, to put it under captivity or anything. But this was in an open market and is out there really displayed for sale. So just to show you uh, uh, the brazenness with which uh, people who trade in uh, and hunt and trap birds in the area operate. Um, so there have been lots of interventions in the area, mostly to protect the, uh, the environment, including the, uh, the birds, the resident and the migratory birds in the area. Uh, some of it has been uh, supported by uh, especially uh, key bird life partners. The RSPB in the UK has had a long history of working with the Nigerian Conservation Foundation in the area, but more recently, Vogelberg Shemin Netherland, VBN, the bird life partner in the Netherlands, has supported a really very interesting and important project there, which is tagged Living on the Edge. And that project has left a lot of, um, uh, of legacy in the area, which is still subsisting. So that project looked at three areas of intervention, really. One is public awareness. The second is the restoration of degraded habitats in the area. And the third area is the livelihoods improvement. And all of these activities are underpinned by research, ecological monitoring, but also by advocacy, both within uh, the wetlands and also uh, to national authorities outside the wetlands. Uh, so if I can go down into each of these areas, especially uh, the habitat restoration part. You can see on this slide some before and after pictures. Like I was saying, uh, the vegetation is really under a lot of threat, not just from graziers, but from people cutting uh, trees for firewood, also farmers clearing bushes for, for farming. And the project tried to restore some of those degraded areas by establishing community nurseries and community tree planting around it. Uh, the other threat to the habitat there, which is responsible for habitat um, um, degradation, is the invasive species that I mentioned, which is choking the channels and the water bodies. And uh, again, at the bottom, there are before and after pictures of uh, channels that have been blocked by this invasive species and how the project worked with the communities in the area uh, to actually clear those channels. Then on the livelihoods improvement um, bit, uh, the project intervened in terms of improving the livelihoods of fisher folk, mostly by clearing the channels of typha and bringing back the water bodies. Uh, the fisheries came back in some of those areas, but there were interventions also uh, in terms of providing fishing gear that are of the uh, appropriate mesh sizes that will not lead to overfishing, and also into smoking the fish as a sort of preservation uh, before taking to the market. And this highly improved the fishing outcomes in the area. Uh, also to supplement protein intake in the area and also in some way provide alternatives to uh, the hunting and trapping of uh, migrant birds. The project also trained community members in poultry production and supported them with startup kits and uh, things to <laughs> grow poultry. It also, uh, to address the cutting down of trees for firewood, uh, trained some of the 
community potters, the people who produce clay pots and clay stoves, in how to make improved stoves that save on the amount of firewood that is used for cooking and trained them and um, uh, supported them in order to market those improved stoves and um, thus disseminated that technology and um, a lot of well efficient wood stoves that had some impact on the amount of firewood taken from the area. Again, uh, the project supported beekeeping, mostly using the uh, Kenyan top bar hive model. And um, uh, that was another successful intervention from, uh, from the project. So it trained people on how to uh, do beekeeping and then provided them with startup kits, which are the protective equipment and the hives themselves. Uh, also, there is a very, very uh, prolific um, tree around there called the doom palm. It is actually the dominant tree when you go around some parts of the wetlands and its leaves can be used to make mats uh, where people sleep on and sit on and so on. And so it trained local women on how to make mats and supported them to make and sell those mats. Uh, finally, another intervention is in terms of uh, some of the resource use conflicts, especially the farmer had uh, clashes. Uh, the project supported the demarcating of boundaries of grazing reserves and grazing routes so that both farmers and herders could know clearly which are the routes that are meant for cattle and other livestock to follow to get to their grazing points and their watering points. And then farmers know that so that they don't plant in the grazing reserves or on the grazing routes, which is normally why it leads to conflicts between farmers and herders. So that clear demarcation of those areas is uh, really a very welcome uh, um, intervention by the project. Um, so I think some of the major highlights of the project is that um, over the period uh, since the project and even up to now that the project has ended about three, four years ago, uh, the numbers of uh, water birds in the area has continued on an upward trend, not just remain stable or turn the curve from before when it was being seriously affected by habitat change and um, exploitation, but the numbers are really um, up now. So our uh, annual census of water birds in the area this year uh, came up with almost 400,000 birds. And this is the highest that has been recorded within the last five to six years because the average over the years has been about a quarter of a million, uh, but it's on an upward trajectory. So I think maintaining the ecological integrity of the wetland and continuing to host these large assemblages of uh, resident inter-African and Paleartic migrant birds is really one of the key highlights from the project. Uh, a second highlight is the clearing of the invasive species of grass, the taifa from the water bodies, up to about 30 kilometers in one of the channels was cleared and restored, and that prevented flooding in uh, communities uh, around the area, and therefore prevented the loss of lives and property by members of those communities, estimated to be uh, more than 10,000. And it also opened up the area and made it more suitable for economic activities like fishing, crop production, and grazing. And we could see that really in terms of the livelihoods of some of these resource users. For instance, uh, the daily income of fisher folk in the area uh, more than doubled because before the clearing, they were earning about three to three and a half thousand. Nigerian Naira in our currency per day, but that jumped to about 79,000 Naira per day 
after the intervention of the project. And then, of course, I mentioned the establishment of community nurseries and plantations. Uh, more than 23 hectares of degraded land was restored with indigenous uh, tree species. And that is really a major outcome of it. And um, you could see it from the appreciation of uh, all the communities where it worked. So the project worked in uh, 10 communities within the wetlands. And this is a sample of the feedback from one of the community heads in one of the communities. So the village head of Majapura uh, wrote, and if you can read what he says in the uh, extract from his letter, he thought the project was really good in addressing resource user conflict, but also bringing about uh, development and financial benefits to uh, members of his community. I think it was really important to mention that the approach of the project itself was very important because right from the beginning, it was built with sustainability in mind. So site support groups were established in all the communities that the project worked. And alongside the site support groups, there were other community-based organizations that were organized, established, and supported to become more effective. Things like resource user groups, like school conservation clubs, and so on. And this is really key. Uh, to the success or any success of such a project in that area. Like I said, uh, law enforcement is definitely a non-starter in this kind of um, uh, areas. And so buy-in from the community and getting them on board is really key. And they have bought so strongly into it, as you saw from the appreciation letter that was sent by uh, one of the community leaders that it's even now that the project activities as a project have sort of ceased because the funding has ended, the communities are still continuing with a lot of the activities that were started during the project. And like I said, uh, the, the site support groups are going on, the community-based organizations are going on, uh, as we speak now, and I'll speak more about it later, that they are even doing some events around the world, Migratory Birds Day, almost autonomously on their own, with very little uh, impetus or support from uh, anybody like us, the Nigerian Conservation Foundation. So uh, I think that key engagement buy-in from the community in the global south in such sites is really one of the key lessons we can take out of this project. I remember when um, Nigerian Conservation Foundation started work at the site long ago, and it mostly started by doing some ecological monitoring, water bird count, and um, censuses and assessment. And alongside that was trying to sensitize the community about not hunting and killing birds and not destroying the habitat. One of the first reaction I got, and I was the project manager then was, look, you are following these Europeans who are coming to do this and they want us not to kill the birds and eat here because they want the birds to go back to Europe so that they can use them for sports in hunting. And that was then, that was the, the sort of, um, the perception of the community, but this has come really a long way now, as I said, and there has really been quite a lot of sustainability elements, which you can see is palpable in the site, um, in many areas around there. So I think I'll stop there. I hope I haven't uh, overstepped my time. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Victorian. That, that was really inspirational. It's so nice to hear a positive story and to hear about the community's involvement and all the work that's been done. So we're going to go into the last presentation before we take more questions. And that's going to be by the AWA Secretariat. So the, the Executive Secretary of AWA, Jacques Trevoux, and then Evelyn Moluko, um, that's a co coordinator for the AWA African Initiative. And that's going to be more around policy uh, for these migratory birds. 
and specifically our water birds. Thank you. To, over to you both. Thank you, Annalyn. I hope everybody is hearing me. Um, yeah, so I'm the executive secretary of AIVA. AIVA is a UN treaty, a legally binding treaty, which is really important, gathering more than uh, 80 parties and uh, a lot of them uh, coming from the East Atlantic Flyway. Uh, our main uh, work is to, to bring a consensus for water bird conservation. Uh, so we, we gather every three years all the parties to AIVA to take stock of the conservation status of uh, species and then to act. And one of our main uh, tools are the action plan for species, either single species or multi, multi species like the Bengala current, which is dealing with seabirds uh, all along the Angola, Namibia and South Africa uh, coast. Uh, but uh, we have also a big campaign for raising awareness for the general public. It is the World Migratory Bird Day. Uh, just a big a short story. Uh, it has been launched by, by the AIVA and the CMS, the Convention on Migratory Species, also based here, here in Bonn. And in 2017, we signed a partnership with uh, the environment for the Americas, making this World Migratory Bird Day really global. Um, we are working with other partners on the ground to promote its celebration on a national and local basis. Um, can mention, of course, for the international partners, BirdLife International, Wetlands International, the Wadden Sea Flyway Initiative, and a lot more. We really need to promote awareness uh, on migratory water birds, and the habitat has been, um, really convinced that we need the support of the general public, local community, people in the cities, just to push our uh, politician to take care of, of those, those birds, yeah. So each year we choose a, a global theme to promote key or emerging issues on migratory bird conservation. In 2019, last year it was, uh, um, we focus on plastic pollution, and uh, we, we get a lot of answer, we get a lot of uh, events. Uh, this year, of course, is a, a year like no others. And uh, we choose the theme, Bird Connect the World. And they connect it, not digitally, but of course, physically, as it has been shown by uh, Jose Alves with the black tail Godwit, for example, and other waters linking the Arctic uh, the temperate zone and the salient zone, and even for some of the waters migrating to the tips of uh, South Africa. So it's really important. Uh, the, the World Migratory Bird Day is organized in two peaks, as already said by Annalyn, just to take care of the seasonality of this migration. Um, October is really a good period to welcome the wintering bird in, in Africa and all along the Atlantic coast. So it's really good. Um, and we choose this theme of connectivity for two reasons. First, of course, we have to keep or to restore the ecological uh, connectivity because it's not only a matter of hydrological basin, but we have seen also that birds are connecting uh, many hydrological basins from the tundra in, in the Arctic till the salient zone, for example, and you have seen on, on, on the previous map, all this hydrological basin, including La Chad, the Nile, the Senegal uh, River, and so on. So it's really important to, to realize that birds are connecting big wetlands and, and really big habitats, and it's really a network of sites. If, for example, the Tagus estuary is really impacted by this airport, it could mean that birds in the Arctic will decline because they will lose this stopover or wintering site. So it's, it's really important to, to keep this network of site all along the flyway. 
Of course, so this year, we will celebrate this World Migratory Bird Day worldwide, but mainly with virtual activities such as webinar, virtual talks, conference, and educational programs. So I invite you to, to visit the, the World Migratory Bird Day uh, website just to know if something is happening near your, your, your home or your, your location. So with that, I will give the floor to, so some picture, yeah, uh, all across the East Atlantic Flyway, you can see that uh, children are really, not only children, but in the Ghana, there was a lot of adults also attending an event. So it's really a celebration for these fabulous birds, which have to cope with uh, long travel quite often, short period of breeding, especially in the Arctic, and uh, a lot of pressure uh, in Africa, because I would like just to remind everybody that the population of Africa will double by 2050. So it means that it will uh, increase the pressure on water and wetlands. And we really need to conserve this habitat, not only for birds, but also for us. This crisis, this COVID or Corona crisis has shown that uh, we need nature. We need nature to prevent zoonosis to, to, to be widespread, of course, but we need also nature for our own mental health. And it's really important to keep part of nature close to us, just to, to relax, to enjoy. And uh, this World Migratory Bird Day is also emphasizes this dimension of connectivity. Thanks, and I will uh, give the floor now to, to Evelyn to talk about the plan of action for, for Africa set up by AEVA Secretariat. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Jacques. Thank you, Hanalin, uh, for passing on the floor to us. It's, a, it's an honor to have the Executive Secretary of AEWA at this event. Um, from the, present the past presentations, we've seen an excellent and impressive network of partners in the BirdLife uh, network of partners. And they're doing an excellent job on the ground to conserve migratory water birds across the flyways in the different parts of the world. And the next question is how do we engage the contracting, the, the, the different countries worldwide? How do we oblige them to take this engagement seriously, especially at the governmental level? That's where AWA comes in as a policy framework, an overarching policy framework in the African, Africa Eurasian region and uh, sets uh, the, the overarching framework for the uh, policy to um, engage contracting parties which sign up for AWA to, uh, with the obligation of conserving the migratory water bird species and maintaining them in a favorable conservation status across the entire flyways. So uh, AWA has, of course, the, the AWA text and the AWA action plan, which are the overarching uh, legally binding documents. There is the AWA strategic plan, but for the African region, we have a dedicated initiative, the African initiative, under which we have a dedicated plan of action for Africa. Many of you must have heard about this um, document in the past, um, which serves as an operational guideline for implementing the AWA strategic plan in the African region. So basically, this guides African parties on what actions and what, uh, what should you do tailor-made for the African region in order to attain the goals and obligations for implementing AWA in the African region or in your countries. So um, the current plan of action, which was developed uh, at the seventh meeting of the parties, or sorry, approved by the seventh meeting of the parties, which took place in South Africa in 2019, um, spans over the period of 2019 to 2027, and was developed in a very uh, interactive, uh, consultative process, which involved a wide range of stakeholders, not just from the African region, but from other parts of the world and different partners, including the governments, as well as the partner NGOs, international governmental organizations, and various partners involved in the working group, if, as we will remember, that was tasked with initiating the process and guiding the process and coming out with this excellent plan, which we have at our disposal now. Um, the plan of action for Africa basically um, 
as, as I said, provides a guideline to implement the AWAS strategic plan in the African region. So it spans over the five objectives of the AWA strategic plan, which are basically key activity areas, key priority areas over which um, migratory water bird conservation and the conservation of their sites are expected to take place. So first is the species conservation, and this basically covers everything ranging from the legislative obligations through to actual activities on the ground, such as the international singles and multi-species action plans, that, uh, uh, that provide um, the key tools for direct uh, guide, uh, guidance for cons conserving uh, species which are of particular global conservation concern. Um, the second is the su is sustainable management of um, species and their habitats. And this covers, for example, issues relating to hunting and um, the lead shot issue, which is an, uh, has been an emerging issue for a number of years and is actually more and more gaining attention and being addressed worldwide. Uh, uh, for objective three, establishing the flyway network of sites. This is basically having to identify what are the key sites for the species which are covered under AWA, what are the key sites in your country and how do you conserve them? And this also includes aspects such as uh, working closely with other site conservation frameworks, including, for example, the Ramsar sites, the bird life, um, important bird areas, how do we, and the World Heritage sites, for example, how do we work together to establish these sites, which are quite often of common uh, interest and uh, importance for the conservation of these species. Uh, the objective four is a new element which was introduced in the last um, phase, in the, in the new uh, phase of the uh, AOA strategic planning and action planning for Africa, which looks at the uh, conservation, conservation from a habitat perspective. And then objective five is more like an overarching um, um, objective which cuts across all the objectives of the AWAS, uh, of, of the AWAS strategic and action plan and covers issues relating to resource mobilization. How do, I, how do we uh, mobilize resources, human, financial and material resources at the national level, at the international level? And this includes issues as well as uh, uh, such as, sorry, um, uh, capacity building um, and, and so on. So um, basically, when we move from the AWA strategic plan to the AWA plan of action, we are taking from strategic planning to action planning, what should we actually be doing on the ground? So I take the example of objective two, which uh, we talked about sustainable um, use and management, of course, of migratory water birds and their habitats. Um, what should we be doing? Um, th what the strategic plan uh, defines is an overarching set of targets and actions that should be done at the agreement level and these need to be attained by the deadline of 2027. And for the African region, for example, under this objective, something as adaptive harvest management, which is a very intensive um, stakeholder process and very complicated, would only be introduced in the African region on, on a very, uh, on an introductory basis. So it would be um, a, like a um, it would only it uh, we we would only like initiate one at, at the most one um, uh, example of an adaptive harvest management process for the African region, depending on what population would be identified as a as a practical example to use. So this is really saying that we are tailoring it to the African region. What do we need? What are our priorities? And where do we stand um, with conservation efforts in the region? All the objectives also I would mention here. Um, sorry, for the, all the um, objectives one to four cover the legislative issues, which are how do you mainstream, for example, all the obligations, especially the after every meeting of the parties where we have um, amendments to the agreement text or to, the, to its annexes, how do you mainstream this into your national or domestic legislation to ensure that your country is uh, committing um, legally to uh, impl uh, implementing the 
agreement at the national level. And there's also the aspect of um, a high level of collaboration is being promoted, which means we are promoting the idea of working together with partners, both at the national level and the international level, regionally, of course, and otherwise. So this starts from mainstreaming into other national policies, for example, what the AWA obligations are. Uh, as well as working, like um, uh, was mentioned in the past presentations, working with the local populations because they, are also, they also constitute a key stakeholder for migratory water bird conservation, being key users of, the, of the, most of the wetlands as well as of the species. Uh, in this slide, the idea is to um, provide uh, an overview of what does this plan of action look like. On the first view, sometimes it would seem a bit intimidating with lots of tables and information, but it's fairly straightforward. Basically, we have translated, as I said, the AWA strategic plan into detailed processes and actions within the AWA plan of action for Africa. So it takes the AWA, obje uh, the AWA strategic plan objectives, targets and activities and defines then for the, in the plan of action, what processes should, should be conducted in order to achieve these targets at the given time. So for example, if we say by MOP8, we need to have identified known sites or existing sites of international and national importance for the AWA populations in your country, then it means by 20 to 2019, the AWA Secretariat, for example, working together with the AWA Technical Committee should have been able to develop and disseminated simple guidelines to guide the contracting parties on how are they supposed to go about this identification of the known sites. And then by 2020, all the parties should have gone through the existing sites. So put together your teams, um, identify the existing sites and communicate them to the AWA Secretariat by 2020. So that by MOP8, we, you, the, you would have been able to achieve the AWA strategic plan objective of having identified and communicated your known sites of international and national importance for the AWA populations hosted in your country. Um, one aspect I would point out here is that the AWA plan of action does uh, establish priorities for each of the actions identified, but this is at an overarching regional level for the African region. It also establishes an indicative range of budgets. For example, we have the, 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 the Euro signs, which indicate a range of budgets from a thousand euros to ten thousand euros to maybe above a hundred thousand euros, and Z there is not like zero, but it's using national resources. This would span from human resources to existing um, frameworks already established at the national region. So it's not a zero budget, but making use of existing resources at the national level. But then the emphasis I would place here is that at the national level, the parties would have to, on their own, establish national priorities based on what are the key issues, what are the emerging issues in my country that I need to address, and also make, make a budgeted plan for your country based on what resources you would need to spend on what issues you are going to address at national level. A new aspect in the new plan of action for Africa is the um, implementation and collaboration along flyways. Of course, the emphasis is on flyway um, conservation. Um, and we have identified for four broad flyways in the African region, which span across the African region, and of course, which overlap. So some countries might find themselves overlapping across these flyways, but then we have what we're talking about, the East Atlantic Flyway and the West Indian ocean flyways, intra-African flyways and the Mediterranean and Trans-Saharan. So we have two coastal, and two inland flyway uh, regions identified. But the key thing here is on the each of these flyways, um, key areas that need attention, key issues, key project ideas have been identified by the partners working in these regions and put down on paper. So they serve as a reminder, as a basis for also fundraising, for paying attention to what are the issues we should really be looking at in these respective flyways as a priority. And you could use this, uh, this would serve also as a uh, a, a kickoff process for the developing projects and initiatives at the flyway level. On, uh, just to highlight also that through implementing AWA, for example, implementing the AWA Plan of Action for Africa in your country, you would not only be responding to the obligations defined on the AWA, which is legally binding for your country as a contracting party, but also to other overarching um, 
uh, issues in the Global Biodiversity Conservation Forum, for, uh, for example, the IHE targets have been identified. Where, do, where does the AWA plan of action contribute to these and the strategic development goals, which are the more overarching, um, the bigger overarching um, frameworks. We also have, of course, the strategic plan for migratory species, where in the, in the strategic plan it shows clearly where are we contributing to issues under this, as well as to issues under the Ramsar strategic plan. We have a plan of action, and of course, each of us, um, be it the AWA Secretariat, be it BirdLife International, be it the governments, the response, the respective contracting parties, have obligations towards implementing this plan of action. Um, as a secretariat, working together with the various bodies established under AWA, talking about the AWA Standing Committee, and especially the AWA Technical Committee, which is a technical body made up of experts in various areas um, identified by the parties to support the technical and scientific work of the agreement. What is our role? We have this overarching role to guide and direct the parties. For example, I mentioned we will have to prepare guidelines on the, one of the activities in objective three to guide the parties on how do you go about achieving this thing, this, this aspect of this activity at your level. So we prepare the guidelines and provide it to the parties to be able to facilitate the process at the national level. We also have this coordinating role. And I, I would use the example here of the international single and multi-species action plans, which are developed to guide conservation of specific globally threatened populations of migratory water birds over a given period of time, usually 10 years. Um, we develop the single species action plans or multi-species action plans, and then we have these international species working groups, which the Secretariat has to support to convene, made up of representative governments and experts from the different uh, key range states for the given population of the species. So our role is to bring together these uh, uh, species action plans, bring together the international working group and secure support and encourage and instigate action for implementation of this uh, species action plans, just as an example. And of course, like I already mentioned, we have to promote and support implementation of the AWA plan of action, AWA strategic plan, AWA single species action plans. And we, so we are constantly and continuously engaged in um, resource mobilization at the, at the agreement level, but that's where our efforts can end because, not end, but can uh, support the most because, um, it, it, given the uh, number of contracting parties and the details and the di di uh, different issues that uh, are, are relevant at the national level, the Secretariat is able to efficiently support at the international level with, for example, um, regional uh, level projects and regional scale projects, regional scale training and so on. And I will come to an example on the next slides. As a contracting party, Many of you on the audience are contracting parties to the agreement. And what are your obligations then? You have to implement the AWA plan of action for Africa. Of course, it goes without say, it's obvious. And the first step, uh, as we encouraged in the plan of action, is to develop your national plan of action, uh, national implementation plans to guide you at the national level, like I already mentioned. Um, the, the budgets, which are indicated in the current plan of action, the, in the regional plan of action are indicative and you would need to have a budgeted national implementation plan, which also establishes your national priorities, your issues. If hunting, for example, is not an issue in your country, then it would not be one of the high priorities to be addressed in your country. If, le if, if uh, use of lead shot is not happening in your country, then you would not have that activity on your national implementation plan, just as an example. And the next obligation I put here is the reporting back on the implementation of the plan of action. Um, eight months before the dates of the meeting of the parties to AWA, and I would just take the advantage to mention that the next meeting of the parties to AWA is already scheduled for five to nine of October, 2021. So you should have this on your calendars. Eight months before this date, we have to, ought to have submitted our reports on the implementation of the plan of action for Africa as was established in um, the resolutions to the seventh meeting of the party. So we are in the process of developing the reporting format. 
in a few weeks at the most, the African contracting parties, the government um, re respo uh, re um, responsible officers for the national focal points would receive this and would have to start populating their national report. So this, this report would, would also be a reminder to take stock of where do you stand with implementing this plan of action? What have we done so far? What is pending and also help us to get back up to speed with implementing the plan of action. At this point, I hope I didn't speak too long or longer than my allocated time. Um, I would stop here and if there are any questions like Hanelin already mentioned, you can type them into the Q&A section and we would answer them to the best of our ability. Thank you very much for your attention and have a lovely rest of the day. Thanks so much, Evelyn and Jacques, for that wonderful presentation. In the interest of time, we've got two more announcements to make, and then we'll go to the questions and answers. So the first announcement up, I'm going to ask Farrant to please give us more information on Global Bird Weekend. Okay, thank you, everyone. And just a very quick um, update on two events that will follow that are also part of the... Um, big celebration we're doing um, for World Migratory Bird Day. So October 17 and 18, um, we're celebrating Global Bird Weekend. And that's a new initiative. Um, it's about stimulating people to go out birding and submit their observations to eBird. Uh, and we, the challenge we, had, we set ourselves is to see as many possible different bird species in a global bird weekend. So everybody in the world is submitting their list and we're going to see how many birds we can see. Um, at the same time, the other challenge is to get as many people as possible to go birding in that weekend. So you can join as an individual, you can join as a team. Um, I will put the link in the chat functions in a second. Um, there is also a prize to be won. If you enter it, you can get nice equipment from Swarovski and you can go on a, a holiday with Rock Jumper. So that's a good one. And the other one, slightly more modest one, no shaking. So this is just one webinar you're listening to now as part of a whole series of webinars. And I want to invite you to come to another webinar, which is on the 14th of October, which is called The Magic of Migrations. And that will all be about the successful actions taken to save migratory bird in a wide variety of topics. So from reducing the risk of collision with energy infrastructures to stopping illegal killing of birds, talking about coastal wetlands, uh, saving coastal wetlands, et cetera, et cetera. So it will be an optimistic session um, showing you that if we put our weight behind it, we can save migratory birds from extinction. So that's my very short presentation. I hope to see you soon in both the Global Bird Weekend and the magic of, magic of migration. Thank you very much. Thanks, Warren. Good. And then we have one more announcement by Mutari. Okay, so I think just following up from, uh, from Bahrain, normally uh, bird life partners all across the flyway will have one event or several uh, that will celebrate this World Migratory Birds Day. It happened really well last year. We had things all over. It was such a cocktail of very interesting stuff. Uh, but this year is the year of the pandemic. So unfortunately, especially most of our European partners where um, sadly the pandemic is hitting harder than in the African side. Um, they had planned things, but those things have been canceled because of uh, new restrictions happening in their country. But still we have some brave and uh, uh, very possible things happening. So I will start from the north to the south of the flyway. And if you see my slide, which means I'm starting from the bottom uh, to the top, and then I'll go to the next page. So Denmark, the bird life partner Dove, is doing bird observation at uh, three of their ranging stations in the next couple of days. So by Friday, um, Spare uh, in Portugal 
did a festival over the weekend, which some of us were really uh, enthused and inspired to see the pictures from that uh, bird observation and nature activities festival in Sagres. Then coming down a bit south to Senegal, Senegal again on Saturday, this coming Saturday, just like a uh, dove, uh, is doing bird watching, awareness raising, and radio talks um, in Jeta, uh, sorry, in Dakar, the capital. Uh, Guinea Bissau, the bird life partner, is doing uh, bird watching, awareness raising, and radio talks uh, on the 9th and 10th. So that's Friday and Saturday in Jeta. Uh, Sierra Leone, the bird life partner, CSSR, CSSR is doing bird watching with oh, one of the school clubs and their own bird club. And it's happening in the Western area peninsula and is the upper Saturday, not this coming Saturday, but the 17th of October. Then us in Nigeria, we have several events lined up in six cities across the country. One of them is going to be in uh, Hade Janguru, and um, which I've just presented something to you about. We are going to do some sensitization work and especially bring together some of the networks that we've had support to do the annual bird census and monitoring, which um, uh, in the past, Iowa Secretariat and then consistently Wetlands International have been supporting us to train local people to actually do the bird censuses. But we are also theming the whole events in Nigeria, or most of them around vultures, because we've just started a campaign on vulture conservation in Nigeria. So the events in the north, in Kano, in the southwest, in two locations are going to be awareness raising and education on vultures. We have tree planting with students in the Niger Delta. Um, and then we have in Lagos here, which is our headquarters, uh, a virtual event, which would be quite interesting because it will have quizzes. It will have a virtual tour of one of our uh, reserves and conservation areas. And that's the 10th of October. And this is open to everybody. So please join us on this. Uh, then going further south to Southern Africa, Bird Life Zimbabwe uh, on the 10th of October, which is coming Saturday, we'll do a migratory bird talk together with uh, one of the Conservation Society's Kids Club in a Ramsa site, Mona Vale Vle Ramsa site. And BirdLife South Africa, again, has a suite of activities which started from uh, last Sunday, but will go on to this coming Saturday. So uh, in fact, they started on the 29th of September. So even before last uh, Saturday with the webinar, uh, whose link they have given sort of in this, that webinar was on making flyway conservation a reality. Uh, and then uh, they started a social media campaign from Friday last week, which is going on on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. They have a press release, uh, an article in an e-newsletter uh, of their in-house newsletter as well. And then finally on Saturday, again, they will cap it off with a spring alive chasing migra migration board game. So that board game will be held at one of their education centers, which is in Vakastrum. Uh, so thank you, Hanelin. I think these are, even within the COVID period, uh, the panoply of activities sort of planned by several bird life partners along the flyway. Thank you. Thanks, Mutari. Um it's great to see how the BirdLife family is going to be celebrating World Migratory Bird Day, and thanks for sharing that with us. So we have literally run out of time now with our original time slot of an hour and a half, so 90 minutes. But um, I know people are going to start to drop off this webinar, so I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists and all the speakers who participated today in this interesting webinar. 
and also to thank all the participants. Many thanks for your interest and for the questions we received. We try to answer as many of those um, possible in writing. I know that there are some unanswered questions still in the Q&A. And when we post the YouTube link um, in a few days, um, we will also answer those questions that we couldn't answer within the session just due to time constraints. I would like to just go into a question and answer session. So we're just going to take about four questions now, um, which I'll be directing directly to some of our speakers today. Good. So um, our first question then is going to be to Wednesday, and that is on whether there's any long-term data, data sets or data repositories available for migratory birds in Africa. So data of any type, species, group, etc., along any flyway. Um, if not, are there plans to support long-term standardized migratory bird counts, monitoring by BirdLife International, considering the threats um, that migrants are facing in Africa? Uh, thank you very much, Hanelin. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the long-term monitoring of migratory birds in Africa has seen some pilot project taking place, like the AfriBirds uh, conducted uh, between uh, NCF and NABU and SOS Foray for the pilot projects in Omo Forest and, uh, uh, and in Côte d'Ivoire. Also, BirdLife uh, partners have worked together, RSPB working with BirdLife Botswana, Nature Kenya, and Nature Uganda to test common birds monitoring scheme uh, that similar to Pan-European Pan uh, common birds monitoring scheme in Europe. So all those tests have been carried out. Now we're in the phase of looking for funding uh, so that we can uh, go out and draw it out. Uh, we've got a design already. Uh, we are looking into the capacity of uh, the, the bird identification uh, so that citizen science can take part and contribute to that research. So uh, watch this space. Do join us. Uh, we're looking for that funding. We hope to be uh, starting to be that database to complement the information available from the Pan-European Common Bird Monitoring Scheme, hopefully soon. Thank you. Thanks. Next question is whether there are any alternative sites around for the birds that are used to forage in the Portuguese site where the airport's going to be built, so for the black-tailed godwits. Um, uh, thank you very much for the question and, and thank you for uh, uh, all the presenters as well for their presentations. Um, I responded a little bit uh, on text to that question already, but um, I think the most straightforward answer is no. And, um, and it's no because um, although we might think that because they do these incredible migrations uh, and they can fly, birds would just simply move elsewhere, the data we have on site fidelity uh, with different methods, colorings, um, tracking devices as a GPS, etc., show very high levels of individual site fidelity. So they use huge, um, they use sites that are at huge distances, but then they're very faithful to the, for example, the breeding territory, especially the long-lived waders, or to their wintering um, areas. Um, on top of that, there are, of course, other wetlands in, in Portugal and there are other wetlands in, in the Iberian Peninsula relatively close by to the Tagus estuary. But it also um, has problems in the sense that moving, let's imagine that the birds would move on, on, on their own if they would move to other areas that would increase carrying capacity on those sites. We know a lot of these populations are already declining, uh, especially Arctic breeding species. So I would say that given that the Tagus is the, the wetland in Portugal that hosts the most birds, it will be really hard to accommodate them, even if it would be possible, in other wetlands, which are already probably close to capacity, or at least have populations that are already threatened and declining. Thanks very much to say. Then a question for Mutari. And that's from Tim Dotman asking, it said it would be interesting to learn more about the captured black crown cranes. And as far as he's aware, this species has been absent from Nigeria for a few decades. Um, Mutari, do you know where they've been captured and possibly might cross-border trade be an option? Yeah, thank you, Tim, for that question. I attempted the question on the text 
chat as well, but I've since talked with um, our director of programs and uh, I think we can confirm that black crown cranes have not been fully extirpated from Nigeria. We still get some of them in the extreme northern border, around the border with Niger, uh, but very few. And so we cannot discount as yet the possibility that these have come from Niger Republic in a cross-border uh, trade as well. So our field team is actually in the field right now looking into this issue and we will respond to you with the findings on the exact origin of those particular birds in the market offline. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mutari. So I'm gonna ask you one more question that's come into the chat box and that is, what is the legal outcome or the process of the airport in Portugal um, where they wanted to build on the wetland? So at the moment, um, at the moment, the Portuguese um, statutory agency uh, that evaluates environmental assessment studies has given the green light. So environmentally, um, there's, um, well, the, the, the plan is going forward. However, um, the, the Bird Life Partner in Portugal, SPEA, that was mentioned earlier about their um, event in Sagres, um, and together with the six or seven other environmental NGOs in Portugal have filed in um, a court case in Lisbon to, well, requesting to nullify this environmental impact assessment study. If that, if that, is, um, if that works out, um, then it means that the process is, is halted. Uh, at the same time, uh, SPEA and, and ourselves have been very active, also with AWA, um, filing in cases, uh, but also to Ramsar and also to Bern Convention, um, requesting all these uh, organizations to be aware of the process and, and also the European Union, of course, um, European Commission. Um, so, so the battle at, at the moment, it's very much on, on, on paper at the moment. Um, we're also developing research, I've mentioned that in my presentation, to try and solidify the international importance of the Tagus and also the functional, the difference in functional roles between the intertidal areas and the host sites. Um, so yeah, um, it's, it's, it's ongoing for a year now, so um, it, it will be long. <laughs> the courts are slow and all these things take time, so hopefully we will have um, outcomes, yeah hopefully, in, I don't know, half a year or so. But so far, this means as well that on the ground, nothing is moving. Thanks, Jose. We're gonna end off with a question to the AWA Secretariat. So Evelyn, this is for you. And what is the support of the AWA Secretariat to the parties to implement the African Plan of Action? Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very pertinent question. I was actually frantically typing a response to that. <laughs> but it's okay, it's actually easier because I realized it was going to be a very long response. It's easier to say that up front. Um, the, the, like I mentioned in my presentation, the AWA Secretariat does try its best to secure funding, but with the current financial climate, it's not very evident to get funds these days for action on the ground. In the past, we had a AWA Small Grants Fund um, initiative or scheme we, under which we gave support for small projects on the ground in the African region because this initiative focused on the African region for the um, past seven years over which it operated. Unfortunately, we don't have funding for that uh, initiative currently in the AWA core budget and our fundraising efforts have not been successful, but we do have projects on uh, which, which are running. We have secured some significant funding from the European Commission. And over the past three years, we're implementing a project um, in relation to capacity building. And like I said, we try to provide this support at the regional level, like we did with the training of trainers for the West and Central African uh, countries uh, a couple of years back uh, on flyway conservation, training on flyway conservation. And I, I see Tim Dodman, our expert is on the 
in, <laughs> is among <laughs> us. <laughs> so thanks to his excellent support and Abdullah in Jaya, we had this excellent training and we expect that the contracting parties would secure then support. Also having done this in, uh, regional training of trainers, also give some backing for support from partners to, uh, to um, engage in uh, similar national training courses once you get back to your countries. So that is how we managed to provide support at the regional level or at an overarching level, flyway level, and hope that this trickles down where, whereby our partners, for example, the Warden Sea Flyway Initiative managed to support one of the national training courses which took place after the regional flyway training of trainers course. We have also recently secured support for a similar training for the small island developing states, which we hope to conduct next year, um, Corona um, permitting, we hope to conduct this training next year and for this one in particular, we're lucky to have secured additional funding for um, follow-up to, to, to um, for a seed funding for some a few follow-up national courses. Among this support, also we managed to get funding for um, conservation action for implementing species the uh, species action plans. So we have, for example, ongoing ones for the white wing fluff tail in Ethiopia at the Berga wetlands which is a very interesting project uh, with the support of BirdLife International and the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority. This project is ongoing, was uh, a bit uh, hindered by the corona outbreak, but things are back on track and we hope the outcomes will be very productive. We also have um, support uh, available for convening the first meeting of the uh, international Species Working Group for the Slaty Egret. I mentioned these uh, international working groups which bring together the partners from the key range states and we hope we can run this also next year. And we would under this as well have uh, two seed grants provided to the key range states, be it partners or government organizations depending on what uh, project proposals are put forward to support action on the ground. So this is actually means by which we manage to support the implementation of the plan of action for Africa, but as I mentioned, at, an, at a more overarching level. And the hope is that we, like I said, we depend on our partners, BirdLife International, Wetlands International, the Wild and Sea Flyway Initiative. Um, the, we have a technical support unit for uh, implementing the AWA plan of action for Africa offered by the government of France, uh, made up of a number of technical partners from Tour du Valais, the uh, um, ONCF, no, no longer ONCFS, OFB, sorry. And uh, uh, the Senegal government had also provided support for this initiative. And this uh, offers excellent support on the ground also for training, capacity building, for water bird counts and site monitoring on the ground. So there is a, a wide range of different sorts of uh, support provided for implementing the AWA plan of action on the ground which uh, upfront you might say the AWA secretary doesn't have a budget or a, a, a fund put aside for this, but there's huge support rallied from the secretariat, from our partners on, on the ground to support the implementation of the plan of action. And one other thing that we had mentioned was just by uh, celebrating World Migratory Birthday, for example, you are contributing to implementing the uh, AWA plan of action in your country. So it's the little drops of water that build this ocean and contribute towards uh, effective implementation of the plan of action. Thank you. Thanks, Evelyn, for really comprehensive answer there. And um, I've got the privilege to work with you on the White Wing Blockville project plan in Ethiopia. Great. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we're going to end here. Thanks again to all the participants and to all the presenters and the panel here today. Special thank you to Ava for joining us and presenting um, on this webinar. And please, if you've got any further questions, feel welcome to contact any of us. There will be a YouTube link that will be shared and some of the unanswered questions will also be answered then. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and take care and celebrate our migratory birds.